Okay, good evening and um, welcome to the 28th Distinguished Du Bois Lecture on this very hot Berlin evening. So we're thrilled that, to see you in such large numbers. Um, my name is Ela Hashemi Yekani and I'm a professor of English and American Studies with a focus on post-colonial studies at Humboldt Universität. And I'm happy to welcome tonight's distinguished prof um, speaker, Professor Kianga Yamata-Taylor on behalf of Humboldt's American Studies Department. Before I will introduce her in some more detail, please allow me to provide a little more context for tonight's evening, as it is a cooperation with Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's International Luxemburg Lecture, for which we are very grateful. We also want to acknowledge our hosts here at Haus der Kulturen der Welt for their generous hospitality, which includes technical support, as well as um, simultaneous translation services into German for German speakers. Also für diejenigen, die nur Deutsch sprechen, ich hoffe, Sie haben sich schon versorgt mit Kopfhörern. Wenn nicht, now is the time, noch schnell uh, sich uh, Kopfhörer zu holen. I also need to mention that tonight's talk and conversation will be recorded and will be made available on the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation website. However, the Q&A will not be taped and the cameras only show the faces of the speakers on the stage, not the audience. Okay, and questions also later on can be asked in um, English and German. Um, I'm also supposed to remind you that if you haven't done so while coming in, to please also sign the list um, of attendance. Following the lecture, there will be a conversation of Professor Taylor with Lauren Ballhorn and Katharina Pühl from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, and they have already joined us here on stage and will introduce themselves later on. Finally, we will also, of course, open for questions from the audience and our student assistants will pass around microphones, um, which already gives me the opportunity to thank them at the beginning, rather the end, when you always forget this. So um, they're Jared Kennedy Loving, Daphne Beers, and Tao Ho. And I also wish to acknowledge Sigrid Venus, um, the department secretary, who has been instrumental in making sure that we can continue the conversation later tonight with some complimentary drinks outside at the nice terrace. So do, do stick around afterwards. Um, there's also a book table for those of you who haven't had a chance to, to already have um, uh, one of the books um, by now, although I have been told that the English edition is already sold out, so there are still German copies um, outside. Finally, thanks are also due to um, Dr. Christina Graf from our department who has been working tirelessly in the past to organize the Du Bois lecture and particularly tonight's event. Now with these preliminaries out of the way, let me say a few words why our department was more than happy to join the efforts in honoring the work of Kianga Yamata-Taylor as part of this combined Luxembourg and Distinguished Du Bois Lecture. The Distinguished Du Bois Lectures have been named in honor of W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the most influential intellectuals, scholars, public figures and writers of 20th century America. He was a doctoral student at Friedrichs Wilhelms Universität, the first African American to receive a PhD from Harvard University in 1895, and was awarded an honorary doctoral degree from Humboldt Universität in 1958, um, which will also hopefully be more prominently commemorated by a plaque in the main building in the near future. In the spirit of Du Bois and with the generous support from the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research of Harvard University, the distinguished Du Bois lectures invite outstanding American scholars and public intellectuals to address the most pressing issues of our times. Therefore, we are immensely pleased to welcome a true embodiment of the ideal of the public intellectual today, whose many accomplishments make it a rather difficult, and I want to say daunting, task to introduce her in but a few words, but I will try as best as I can. Kianga Yamata-Taylor received her PhD from the Department of African American Studies at Northwestern University in 2013, and currently is assistant professor in Charles H. Mac McKilvin University Perceptor at the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University. She's also a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Taylor is a widely sought public speaker and writer, truly a scholar, author, and activist who engages publics well beyond the academy, 
In 2016, she was named one of the 100 most influential African Americans in the United States by The Root. Her writing has been published in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Boston Review, Paris Review, The Guardian, Jacobin, and beyond. To provide ample political commentary, Taylor embeds her work in the tradition of radical black feminist thought and activism. Even before Kimberly Crenshaw introduced the now well-known term intersectionality, the Kumbahi River Collective, a radical black feminist organization formed in 1974, spoke of interlocking systems of oppression and identity politics in their famous 1981 A Black Feminist Statement. These women paved the way for social analysis that combines an interest in material and economic factors with the politics of location, a concept so relevant for all of us working in American, African-American, post-colonial, queer, and gender studies today. In the edited collection, How We Get Free, Black Feminism and the Kambahi River Collective, which won the Lambda Literary Award for LGBT nonfiction in 2018, Taylor interviews, among others, Kambahi River authors Barbara Smith, Beverly Smith, and Demita Fraser to remind us of the timeliness of their concerns. Taylor's own work elegantly combines empirical rigor with political vision, African-American studies with urban studies. She examines race and public policy, including American housing policies, in her book, Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermine Black Home Ownership, which is forthcoming from the University of North Carolina Press later this year. Looking at the past of community organizing, the ascendance of Obama and the powerful impetus of black queer women taking center stage in the Black Lives Matter movement in her 2016 publication, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, which won the Lannan Cultural Freedom Award for an especially notable book. She is highly critical of the neoliberal era of free market reform and the rollback of social spending. Taylor high, highlights how class continues to inform social divides among African Americans who are still disproportionately at the risk of poverty, imprisonment, <clears throat> and premature death. Despite the current, the current political climate, her work remains a hopeful and inspiring voice in what is probably one of the most challenging times for the United States left. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Kianga Yamata Taylor to the stage to discuss racial justice and the future of American politics with us today. Thanks very much. Um, Thank you for coming today. Uh, I'd like to thank the Rosa Luxemburg Institute and for inviting me um, along with uh, Humboldt University. Uh, very glad to be here um, to talk with people, despite the weather. Um, so I'm going to uh, probably talk for about 40 minutes, and um, then we're going to talk about what I talked about, and then we'll have a... Uh, <laughs> We'll have a more open um, conversation, so I will just get started. Um, we are more than two and a half years into the Trump administration, the administration of Donald Trump. Um, and the shock of its open racism, sexism, xenophobia, and corruption, at least in the United States, has given way to a sharpening rise in struggles against it. We're in the several months after the initial shock of Trump's election. There was a kind of nebulous and loose sense of what was termed resistance. The last year, the last year and a half, has been more like clearly attuned to resistance that is rooted in struggle, organizing, and a deeper political clarity about what is at stake. The fears that Trump represented a return to a much earlier period in the United States of open racism and hostility to non-white people has been realized. Trump has emboldened the white supremacist right and activated its most violent among them to engage in direct depraved acts of violence and attack. 
According to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the state police in the United States, which always underreports these numbers, there has been a 17% rise in hate crimes in the country since 2017. From the horrific massacre of Jews at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania last fall, to the seeming mundane arrival of white supremacists um, at a bookstore in Washington, D.C. last March to shut down a talk on racism. The hard right in the United States continues to grow. But some of the most outrageous racism has its expression in the actions of the Trump administration itself. The racist ban of Muslims traveling into the United States is but one example. Trump's policy to both separate and lose, to lose children of migrants crossing through the southern border, a policy he has justified by referring to Central American and Mexican immigrants as rapists, drug dealers, and gang members. And every day there's something new. Just uh, a few minutes ago before I got up here, there was announced a new Trump policy that cancels English classes, uh, soccer, and legal aid for immigrant children who are being held at the border. But these racist attacks do not happen in a vacuum. They are deployed alongside a simultaneous attack on the standards of living of working class and poor people across the United States. They are accompanied by the most dramatic redistribution of wealth in the last two generations from the 99% to the 1%. Islamophobia and anti-immigrant racism are cynically wielded to justify the astonishing military budget of the United States, which this year topped $717 billion. The racially charged discourse of crime in the United States is justified to further bloat the budgets of police departments across the country, while social welfare in the public sector is forced to do more with less. The political right's use of racism to divide, immiserate, and simultaneously plunder the working class and poor has deepened social and economic inequality in the US. But this has not been a one-sided affair, far from it. Over the last year in the US, we have seen the emergence of significant and important struggles from the wave of rank and file led teacher strikes, which have continued from West Virginia to Kentucky to Los Angeles to Denver to Oakland and continue to catch fire across the US. The strikes have helped break open a crucial discussion among, among many things, but they have also struck at the heart of class polarization in the US. The attrition of the public sector and public services, the deplorable conditions of work in American schools, and the impoverishment of US educators because the governing bodies on the city, state, and federal level refuse to tax the rich a commensurate amount in accordance with their wealth. But of even more consequence, the strikes have demonstrated how to challenge not only Trump and Trumpism, but the entire political project of austerity, budget cuts, and the unrelenting attacks on the living standards of ordinary people. The strikes have not only highlighted the dimensions of class warfare in the US, but they have also shown how oppression intersects with economic inequality. The teacher strikes have been led by women, and in urban areas, black women have played a particularly prominent role. But it is, just, it is not just the economic issues driving a real breathing resistance in the US, but the women's marches, climate activism, and on have provided an outlet on both social and economic issues, and in doing so, have shown the potential for mass movements to create new possibilities. More people have participated in marches and demonstrations in the United States in the last two years two years and a, two and a half years than in the 40 previous years. The despair of economic and social instability in the US in combination with the exhilaration of the possible found in the marches and demonstrable opposition to the hate and racism metastasizing in the heart of American society has created the political space for the emergence of socialism in a mass scale in the US. Socialism is no longer a dirty word. And that's not a new phenomenon. In 2016, Bernie Sanders, an open socialist, received uh, 13 million votes, something completely unheard of. 
uh, in his pursuit to be, uh, become the Democratic Party's candidate for president. Today, Bernie Sanders remains the most uh, um, uh, well-liked, this is a category they measure in the US, uh, um, political candidate um, in the United States. And even though it's lightly reported across the country, uh, he is one of the leading candidates to um, get the, uh, uh, to represent the Democratic Party in a contest against Trump. And as a result of this space that has been opened, the one-sided story of pessimism that began the Trump administration has given way to a growing belief that we can struggle and challenge his agenda. At the same time, big questions remain as to how we are able to do this effectively. While there have been historically large protests throughout the last two years, we do not yet have a mass movement in the US. The mobilizations have not yet been transformed into lasting organization. We don't yet have continuity between different mobilizations and even when they are in response to the same or similar issues. We struggle with meaningful solidarity that seeks to unite struggles. And there is the looming threat that the forthcoming 2020 presidential contest will be used by the most centrist and conservative Democrats to advance a narrative that we simply need to return, we simply need to, quote, get back to normal, completely ignoring how the status quo and the failures of the previous administration helped to pave the way for Trump in the first place. In 2008, there were great expectations for the Obama administration for reform and change after the disastrous Bush uh, uh, administration. Disasters that included the entry of the US into an illegal war in Iraq and Afghanistan. The drowning of New Orleans exacerbated by the ineptitude of the Bush administration. And the implosion of the United States economy. There were great expectations and then great disappointment with the administration to fundamentally change the direction of the United States. And for those who say that those expectations were set too high, they ignore the ways that the Obama campaign situated his candidacy as the true inheritor of the civil rights movement. The big expectations were fueled by the even bigger promises of Obama to champion substantive change in the US. But if Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign was anything, and it wasn't much, but if it was anything, it was an indictment of, its fa of the failures of the Obama administration to transform the status quo. Clinton was supposed to be Obama's third term, and instead we ended up with Trump. All of that is to say that the Trump administration was not some strange breach with the US's supposed long march towards progress, as American liberals and conservatives like to tell themselves. Instead, white supremacy, Police terrorism, abject inequality, and racial subjugation are the enduring cords that tie this administration to the very long lineage of American carnage in the name of empire and domination. In a country born of the genocide of the indigenous population that were there first, enriched by centuries of forced labor by enslaved Africans, and where the wealth was multiplied by the violent expropriation of successive waves of immigrant labor. Trump is tradition, not subversion. The problems in the United States transcend any one political party, president or candidate for president. The Black Lives Matter movement has helped, to under, has helped us understand this more than anything else. As the movement unfolded in the shadows of the Occupy movement, it exposed that economic inequality was only one aspect of injustice in the US. With the election of Trump, the movement has been less visible or even active as police abuse and violence has continued in black communities. Moreover, the bigger questions concerning what kind of movement do we need and how do we build them are at the center of why understanding the Black Lives Matter movement remains important. And this is not just for the sake of historical accuracy or clarity, but there remains a clear and urgent need for movement, a movement like Black Lives Matter. Almost five years after the eruption of Black Lives Matter, 
The police in the United States remain on pace to kill nearly 1,000 people, as they have over the last five years since statistics began uh, to be kept. The cases continue to be egregious. One could go on at length about this, but the most recent, two weeks ago, a 44-year-old black woman in the city of Houston in the state of Texas who was unarmed was shot five times by a white police officer while she lay on the ground. Many of these cases continue to have video evidence, but they no longer shock the conscience in the U.S. Not because they are not horrible, but because they no longer are accompanied with street demonstrations that narrate more clearly what we are witnessing when the police murder black people. This is why the emergence of Black Lives Matter, the social movement in 2014 was so critical. It dramatically expanded our understanding of the nature of policing in the US. For example, Movement activists argued that the issues with policing should not be seen in isolation or separate from the broader economic uh, issues. In fact, the economic issues are critical to understanding the policing issues. When the political establishment decides that it will no longer invest in the institutions or jobs or development necessary to revive neighborhoods or communities, it relies instead on policing. Police, in effect, become the public policy of last resort. The police are used to hem in the frustration in black working class communities and to crack down when it threatens to exceed the boundary of the neighborhood. But Black Lives Matter also showed the limits of reform when it comes to police departments. This was especially true as police departments raced to institute body cameras as superficial changes that were held up as substantial reforms uh, uh, to how police functioned. For many activists connected to the movement, the recalcitrance of state power in maintaining the status quo, along with the unrepentant continuation of police abuse and violence, led many of them to the same conclusions that Martin Luther King had reached by the end of his life. In an essay published in a collection of writings, an essay, uh, this was published in 1969, um, in a collection called A Testament of Hope. They were published a year after um, King's assassination. He wrote about the centrality of the black struggle in the late 1960s. He wrote, quote, in these trying circumstances, the black revolution is more than a struggle for the rights of Negroes. It is forcing America to face all of its interrelated flaws, racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. It is exposing the evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. Returning to the roots of Black Lives Matter then allows us to do three things. It helps us reject the romantic delusions of the past or the idea that we should aim to return to the normal of the previous Obama administration. And in doing so, understanding the movement also exposes the interrelated flaws of racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism in US society today. Finally, it shows us the explanatory power of social movements, but also the limits of reform in a society where oppression and exploitation are so embedded that they are constitutive of the society itself. Where movements begin is always contested, but I look to the explosion of the Ferguson Rebellion in August of 2014 as a touchstone that catalyzed what would become the Black Lives Matter movement. The Ferguson Rebellion was democracy come alive. It is impossible to forecast when or where a rebellion against the status quo will erupt. But when it does, it immediately makes clear what is typically obscured in our societies. This is what King was alluding to in terms of what the black movement could expose in the United States. This meant multiple things in the summer of 2014. While the rise of Obama and the growth of the black political class projected one image of black America, 
The vast majority of black people remained hidden, invisible, disposable. The rise of the black political and economic elite not only represented blackness as the flip side of whiteness, but through their own success, they instituted, they insisted that the institutional, structural aspects of racial inequality in the United States was historical, a relic of the past. They professed that their existence alone was proof that the US had changed. Where deprivation continued to exist, those who were deprived were resolutely blamed for conditions of their own making. Indeed, this became a calling card for Obama, making fun of the travails of poor black people in ways that would have been impossible for any white politician to engage in. Indeed, the Obama generation became the Ferguson generation. Young black people who had believed in the slogan, yes we can, who voted like they had never voted before, but who had also grown tired and weary of cheap campaign slogans, paternalistic scolding, and a lightweight political agenda that did next to nothing to restore the enormous losses wrought by the financial crisis of 2008. And so again, with big expectations from the first, for the first black president, came big disappointment at his failure to deliver. And it was in the streets where the promise or even the possibility of democracy or the voices of those people, those young black people, could finally be heard. Ferguson was also a reminder that in the United States, as everywhere, history is always tied to the present. Indeed, we cannot make sense of our current moment without a rich and engaged understanding of the past. As early as 1951, civil rights activists in the United States raised the slogan, we charge genocide, to describe the complicity of the American state with the murder of black citizens by the police. They presented a petition to the United Nations in 1951 that read in part, quote, once the classic method of lynching was the rope, now it is the policeman's bullet. To many an American, the police are the government, certainly its most visible representative. We submit that the evidence suggests that the killing of Negroes has become police policy in the United States. And that police policy is the most practical expression of government policy. Ferguson was a reminder that the most practical expression of government policy had never changed. The murder of Michael Brown Jr. exposed the limits of so-called progress and the emptiness of promises of a post-racial United States. Working class, and Af working class and poor African Americans lifted the cloak on police abuse and violence and exposed its connection to wider systemic flaws. Ferguson exposed how policing could be used to discipline black people generally with the threat of physical or economic violence. We learned that the Ferguson police and indeed police throughout the state of Missouri saw black people's arrest or punishment as a source of revenue which allowed them to avoid raising taxes on white people. The protest revealed how thousands of black people were entrapped by a system of legal fees and fines because they were seen as civically and socially disposable. In the eyes of the law and the legislators that the law was beholden to, black lives did not matter. They treated black people in ways that they could not get away with treating most white people. So the heroism of Ferguson was rooted in the ways they overcame the fear that had been instilled by the ruthless and racist treatment by police for generations. In doing so, their protests, their uprising, generated an enormous sense of solidarity. People not only marched in solidarity with, with folks in Ferguson, but it compelled them to stand in opposition to what police were doing in their own cities, towns, and suburbs. The Ferguson Rebellion also showed what real democracy could look like when they refused to, the young black people who made up the rebellion refused to acquiesce to the chorus of liberals and Democratic Party operatives who told them to get off the streets. For them, democracy would be forged in the freedom of the street, 
the street meetings, the night marches, and the demonstrations themselves. The tributaries of Ferguson, Cleveland, Los Angeles, Staten Island, these are all places where people, black people, young black people, black women, black men had been killed in the weeks after the murder of Mike Brown in the summer of 2014. All of these incidents of police terrorism, police murder, fed the watershed that became Black Lives Matter in the fall and winter of 2014 and 2015. Tens of thousands of people across the United States participated in acts of nonviolent disobedience. This was in December of 2014. Lawyers, doctors, college students, high school students, nurses, ordinary people, professional athletes. On December 13, 2014, 50,000 people marched through the streets of New York chanting with chants that connected Ferguson, Missouri to New York City and then to the nation. The chants were hands up, don't shoot, I can't breathe, Black Lives Matter. There were protests across the country in, nation, in cities large and small. The scattered protests cohered through the chant, demand, declaration, Black Lives Matter, in ways similar to the cry of freedom now during the Civil Rights Movement. The Ferguson Rebellion then gave way to the Baltimore Rebellion in April of 2015, when after the murder of 25-year-old Freddie Gray, a young black man, questions persisted over how African Americans could overcome the continuation of police violence and brutality. The recurrence of this question forced larger questions onto the movement from its friends as well as its enemies. Black Lives Matter, the movement, was chastised for raising bigger questions. The chastising came in the form of constantly asking, who is the leader of this movement? Activists were continually asked, what is the agenda of the movement? But not in ways intended to seek the answer, but in ways meant to undermine and demoralize the efforts of its activists. The constant queries were intended to divide a movement between those who, quote, want to get things done, who are perceived to be realistic and pragmatic compared to those who were portrayed as unrealistic in their demands for systemic change. The political establishment led by Barack Obama sought to rescue the status quo by pressuring the movement to narrow its perspectives and him and its horizons to shift its demands from what it wanted to what was deemed possible. For example, when an activist, a black woman from Chicago named Asleen Pulley, refused to go to a closed door meeting at the White House, Barack Obama personally called her out. Obama said, quote, the value of social movements and activism is to get you at the table, get you in the room, and then start trying to figure out how is this problem going to be solved. You then have a responsibility to prepare an agenda that is achievable, that can institutionalize the changes you seek and to engage the other side. This really showed how much of the criticism was about curtailing the deepening radical conclusions many activists were reaching. These included calls for abolishing the police, prisons, and demands for a massive redistribution of wealth and resources from the rich to the working class. In many ways, you could see how the Black Lives Matter movement contributed to the conditions that gave rise to the viability of Bernie Sanders' candidacy. And this was the real problem with the movement for the Democratic Party and their liberal supporters. In 1964, black political activist and strategist Bayard Rustin argued that the civil rights movement and the new emergence of black uprisings in that same year must be prepared to shift from protest to politics. He argued, quote, it is clear that Negro needs cannot be satisfied unless we go beyond what has so far been placed on the agenda. How are these radical objectives to be achieved? 
The answer is simple, deceptively simple, through political power. We are challenged now to broaden our social vision, to develop functional programs with concrete objectives. Rustin was suggesting that the shift into formal politics marked a sign of political maturity and offered an opportunity to deliver much more substantive change to black communities than protest alone could deliver. In many ways, it was a very reasonable proposition. Indeed, Rustin argued for this approach in 1964, and this was very much the trajectory that black politics evolved along. One could say that the election of Barack Obama in 2008 was the culmination of that strategy, from protest to a black president. But more than 50 years later, that strategy has failed. Its failure lay at the root of the Baltimore uprising in 2015. If Freddie Gray could be murdered by police in a city governed by a black woman as mayor, with a black police chief, where half of the city council was African American, 40 miles from Washington, D.C., where the first president, black president resided in the White House, where the first black attorney general ran the Department of Justice, with more black political representatives in the U.S. Congress than at any other point in the nation's history, and that even when the rebellion broke out, it was a black lieutenant who marshaled the National Guard, the troops, in Maryland into the streets of Baltimore. If none of that black political power could protect Freddie Gray from having his neck broken by the police, then black people would need much more than black elected officials or racial representation in the governing institutions to achieve any semblance of justice. Indeed, the focus on electoral politics, especially coming out of Black Lives Matter, the movement, misses the way that the social movement itself, along with protests and demonstrations, had been fundamental to achieving what we consider to be progress in the US. In the 1960s, when African Americans were almost completely locked out of positions of power, it could make sense that the next step was electoral politics. But then and now, the pivot to elections has often distracted from the more important efforts towards building the broadest and most multiracial movement possible, not only to fight against Trumpism, but to fight for the things that we want. The social movement is the mechanism that preserves the interest of those outside of the corrupting and tranquilizing influence of electoral politics. It doesn't mean that electoral politics are irrelevant or should be ignored. They should not be. But we should also not ignore the power of social movements or mass movements to also make elected officials more receptive or cooperative with the aims and objectives of our struggles. Everything that we have resembling progress in the United States has come through struggle. It has come through the urgency, determination, and creativity of ordinary people. Asleen Pulley, the working class black woman from Chicago that Obama personally chastised for refusing to partake in a meeting convened at the White House, had a vastly different vision of change compared to the one offered by the President of the United States. She wrote in an open letter in response to his criticism of her, quote, I could not with any integrity participate in such a sham that would only serve to legitimize the false narrative that the government is working to end police brutality and the institutional racism that fuels it. For the increasing number of families fighting for justice and dignity for their kin slain by the police, I refuse to give its perpetrators and enablers political cover by making an appearance among them. We assert that the truer revolutionary and systemic change will ultimately only be brought forth by ordinary working people, students, youth, organizing, marching, taking power from the corrupt elites. The transformative power of the social movement is not only about the co its coercive influence in policymaking or the governing institutions of the United States, generally speaking, but we must also consider
the power of collective organizing and the movement on ourselves. The radical artist and critic John Berger in 1968 wrote of mass demonstrations saying, quote, theoretically, demonstrations are meant to reveal the strength of popular opinion or feeling. Theoretically, they are an appeal to the democratic conscience of the state. In this sense, Berger wrote, the numbers present at a protest are significant, not because of their impact on the state, but on those who participate. Continuing, the importance of the numbers involved is to be found in the di direct experience of those taking part in or sympathetically witnessing the demonstration. For them, the numbers cease to be numbers and become evidence of their senses, the conclusions of their imagination. The larger the demonstration, the more powerful and immediate, visible, audible, tangible, a metaphor it becomes for their total collective strength. The point is that movements not only create the possibility of changing our material conditions by exerting the force of many upon the intransigence of the few, but social movements create arenas where we ourselves can be transformed. The mass movement breaks us from the isolation of everyday life. The United States deifies the lie of rugged individualism the idea that wrongly attributes our successes to our personal ingenuity and blames our failures on personal weaknesses and defect. The mass movement, that arena of struggle, brings us together to share in our failure and to show our connection and relationship to each other. The prevailing ideas in our society reinforce the sense of fragmentation and disconnection. But struggle shows what we have in common it pierces the prevailing common sense about our society. What you see is not what you get. We have to challenge the simple narratives fed to us that are intended to make sense of the world we live in. The black radical feminist and organizer Ella Baker understood this. She wrote that if we are serious about transforming society, then we must understand society. And if we are to understand society, that we must look more deeply and not accept at face value what we are told to be true. She said in 1969, quote, in order for us as poor and oppressed people to become a part of a society that is meaningful, the system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. This means that we are going to have to learn to think in radical terms. I use the term radical in its original meaning getting down to and understanding the root cause. It means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising means by which you change that system. Black Lives Matter opened the possibility, but also raised infinitely more questions. Black Lives Matter was an entry point into an examination of a society that locks people into perpetual poverty and an inequality and then cages and ruthlessly punishes them when they dare to challenge or reject their condition. Social movements can certainly challenge the methods of policing, the conditions that make black people vulnerable to policing, and they can even get some methods of policing or incarceration to stop. But a social movement intended to reform the system of inequality cannot undo policing, prisons, jails, and the poverty and racism that make it all acceptable in our society. A profit system that operates in ways that creates enormous riches for a tiny percent of the population while producing hardship and misery for millions more uses racism to explain away its inequality. Black people, they say, are lazy, for example, while driving walls and wedges between black, white, Mexican, Muslim, and all who have an interest in fighting alongside each other. The crises we face in the US are problems of the market, meaning that they are permanent features of our society. Misery means profit. Hunger means profit. Disease means profit. Addiction means profit. Racism means profit. The depth of the crisis we face because of their rootedness within the economic system necessitates engaging the questions of how we deepen our organizing beyond the impressive mobilizations that have shaken American society over the last two and a half years. It means that we need organizing with clearer and more accessible entry points, 
We need a deeper commitment to democracy in our organizing, to ensure the greatest participation, and to imbue a real and actual sense of ownership within these movements. But we must not also be bound by the pragmatic and reasonableness of achieving so-called measurable results, that we sacrifice inherent hope and optimism for a better world that is often what propels people into activism in the first place. Daily organizing requires that we have a firm grasp on reality and what is achievable on a given day with the resources and people that have assembled for that day. But if we are only myopically committed to what is possible that day, we miss the possibilities promised by more resources, more people in the days ahead if our movements balance what is possible with what we want. In the black movement, this has meant that we not only grapple with how to deal with the daily assaults on black life, but we must leave space to engage with the larger issue of how we get free. The best of the black radical tradition has always understood that black liberation, the notion that black people can live free of physical, economic, and social coercion cannot be achieved within capitalism. The dialectic of reform and revolution cannot be unleashed by privileging one above the other. Instead, the fight for our daily lives is a precondition for imagining a different world altogether. Black Lives Matter as a belief an utterance, a collective chant, and a possibility is an example of this. From Ferguson to the Baltimore Rebellion, the commitment, solidarity, and struggles of young black people provided a glimpse of freedom to those living under the policeman's boot for their entire lives. Those struggles are only the beginning. The Black Women's Manifesto, published in 1970 by the Third World Women's Alliance, described how we go from the struggles of one to the struggles of many. They wrote, quote, the new world that we are struggling to create must destroy oppression of any type. The value of this new system will be determined by the status of those persons who are presently most oppressed. Unless women in any enslaved nation are completely liberated, the change cannot really be called a revolution. A people's revolution that engages the participation of every member of the community, including men and women, bring about a certain transformation in the participants as a result of this participation. Once you have caught a glimpse of freedom or tasted a bit of self-determination, you cannot go back to the old routines that were established under a racist capitalist regime. Another world is possible, but we are the only ones who can create it. No one is coming to save us. We must join together to save ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for um, a very powerful presentation. Um, uh, uh, my name is Lauren Bellhorn. I'm from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. Uh, I run our English language website. And next to me is my colleague. Katharina Pühl. I'm working in the Institute for Social, An for Social Analysis uh, uh, there. And with regard to feminism and feminist critique of capitalism. And we kind of teamed up together from two different departments of the Stiftung to put this event on. Um, and so basically, we're going to ask Kiang a few questions and then allow also some questions from, uh, fr from the audience and just try to have a dialogue um, revolving around questions of black liberation. Obviously, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, for those of you who don't know, we are one of the six foundations uh, associated with parliamentary parties in the, in the German parliament, uh, ours being the one associated with uh, Die Linke, the left-wing party, and thus the only foundation that is explicitly geared towards uh, some kind of democratic socialist vision of the future, um, of which key components are obviously anti-racism and internationalism. And so, not unsurprisingly, that theme will also flow in uh, to the conversation, but anyone is welcome to ask. 
uh, whatever they want. I wanted to start uh, with a question. Um, I mean, you uh, you opened your 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 presentation uh, talking about working against the one-sided narr narrative of pessimism, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's uh, very important that we don't uh, collapse into pessimism. Um, uh, I did nevertheless want to talk about maybe the negative side as well. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you wrote your book about three years ago, mm -hmm. give or take. Um, and I can remember the last time I saw you was about a week after Trump was elected. Um, you gave uh, a barnstorm speech uh, in Chicago with Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, and the feeling I had at that moment was, okay, either either everything is going to fall apart in this country or we're going to have some kind of social explosion because the energy in that, at that moment felt like the one thing that could not happen is this couldn't just become normal. You know, mm -hmm. this seemed like such an exceptional moment. And of course, I agree with you that the point that there's continuity to this, that Trump is not an aberration. Um, nevertheless, he does represent an extreme aggravation, I think, in some points. But at the same time, we have not witnessed... Uh, either the collapse of the American democratic system nor mm -hmm. um, any kind of explosion. It seems like there it's is... Early. There's a, well, there's a, yeah, there's a normalization going on, and there's not... I mean, there's a lot, lot of struggles like you, like you have mentioned, but um, specifically Black Lives Matter we've not seen on the, on the radar recently. Uh, and so just three years later from your book, what, uh, what's happened um, in, in the Black Lives Matter movement and more broadly under Trump? What kind of effects has this had? on black life, but also on American public life in general? Oh. Um, there's, there's, I mean, there's a lot to, there's a lot to say about that. Um, Trump, Trump has been the disaster that um, I think uh, everyone thought that he would be. Um, and so there is the, the dynamic, some of which I tried to outline um, in the talk, where there, every day there's like a new um, scandal, there's a new law, there's some new thing that comes out of the White House that uh, has kept people kind of off balance for, you know, probably the first year. And then it does lapse into uh, the kind of normalization of the absurd because it, it just is an onslaught that is happening um, constantly. So there's, there's that which creates its own set of uh, dynamics. I think that it is important to say that, um, as I, I alluded to in the talk, that in the last uh, couple of years, there have been enormous protests. I mean, the Women's March um, protests that uh, the first one that happened on the, uh, during the inauguration uh, of, of Trump or the day after the inauguration of, of Trump, at least in the United States, um, brought out four million um, people thereabouts. It's the largest uh, set of demonstrations um, in, in U.S. history. And each successive, you know, there have been two more uh, that haven't been that big but have been very big. Um, there have been huge marches around climate. Uh, there have been all sorts of uh, different kinds of actions around immigrant rights or against Islamophobia, all those sorts of things. But the, the problem is that it doesn't yet quite feel like a social movement because it's not, meaning that um, it hasn't, these disparate movements stay somewhat isolated unto themselves and it hasn't cohered uh, around a universal set um, of demands that have brought people uh, together across different movements. Um, and so these are things that people are aware of and are trying to uh, figure out how uh, to, to address those issues. But there's the election that looms in the, in the background. And because Trump is so disastrous, um, of course, people think that the main thing that we have to do uh, is get him out of office. And to some degree, it's, it's, it's not very difficult to argue with that. I mean, there's a degree to which um, there, there certainly the, there's a logic uh, to that that is hard to uh, dispute. Um, but I do think that it matters who. 
Um, I support uh, Sanders' candidacy and his efforts to become uh, the nominee for the, um, for the Democratic Party because I think in the U.S. we face the problem that um, there are 240 million eligible voters uh, in, the in the United States. In 2016, only 100 million of those people voted. Um, and so there are 138 million people um, who were so, uh, yeah, there, there are problems with voter suppression, but for the vast majority of those people, it, there is the feeling that it does not matter who you vote for. If in, you know, the UN came to uh, rural Alabama, uh, the weeks after the election, they had already been invited by the, um, the Obama administration, um, and they came up with a report that showed that Alabama, the state of Alabama, has uh, the worst poverty in the developed world. And so if you have had a PVC plastic pipe linking from your toilet to a hole in your front yard through Clinton, through Clinton, through Bush, through Bush, through Obama, through Obama, what is exactly the compelling reason to get you to go out and vote in 2016? What, what is, fits with the narrative that this is the clash of civilizations uh, election, Bush or, or Clinton versus uh, Trump? And so that is, is really the, the issue, is, the, is there a candidate um, that cannot just talk about how dysfunctional horrible and evil Donald Trump is, but that can actually provide some vision about a different way that we should be living um, more generally. Uh, so that, that's, that's one, you asked me a big question, so I'm giving you a long answer. Um, that's, that's one set of explanations. As far as Black Lives Matter is concerned, I think that, um, you know, I think that within the movement, there was the idea that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And so in the last six or seven months, there was an effort um, from an umbrella group called the Movement for Black Lives that includes uh, around 60 different organizations affiliated uh, with Black Lives Matter who, that came up with a very extensive policy platform um, for all of the things that I think they thought they were going to spend the next four years wrangling the Clinton administration for, um, and then Clinton lost, and that threw them uh, off. And I think that they have been not able to figure out how, what to do once you get beyond the mobilizations around um, this or that particular case. Uh, how do you go from that uh, to organizing on a daily basis, and if we're going to do that, what exactly is it that we are fighting for? And so the political debates in the movement around are we doing quick, uh, easy, you know, body cameras, uh, accountable civilian review, board, review boards in different um, cities was one set of questions or a few sets of questions for people. And then there were other people who were coming to drastically different conclusions about um, why do we have police? Uh, should we be trying to get rid of prisons and, um, and jails? And you know, some people are like, what are you talking about? We're trying to stop police brutality right now. These are far off ideas, except there is a movement underway to make radical changes within the criminal uh, injustice system. Um, in the United States. And so without the space, really, which never developed in Black Lives Matter, uh, to debate these questions and to come to some kind of resolution, even if it was that we fundamentally disagree about these things, that never happened. And so um, the movement kind of hit some walls and has yet to be able to recover from them. I'll try to ask a slightly <laughs> smaller question this time, but nevertheless, building on the big one. Um, so, right, it seems to me like uh, when we, because you, you, you brought up, or you already brought up Bernie Sanders, so I'll just admit it. I want to talk about Bernie Sanders for a minute. But specifically, I want to ask, um, 
you know, it seems to me like we can put Black Lives Matter in a series, or perhaps we can understand it as part of a broader movement cycle. Um, maybe we could take sense the financial crisis, or sense Obama's election might be actually a good uh, caesura. But we had Occupy Wall Street, we had Black Lives Matter, we had Me Too, and all of these, uh, um, you know, outbursts of justified outrage at a certain social injustice or a certain trigger. Sometimes it's an event, sometimes it's a broader fact like the grotesque in, in economic inequality in the United States. But as far as I can tell at least, and you may disagree, without exception, they have all petered out sooner or later precisely because of the impasse you describe. And it seems to me the one maybe qualitative new development since 2015 with Bernie Sanders, that Bernie Sanders kind of kicked off this rebirth of the American socialist tradition um, that seems to be developing fragile but nevertheless durable structures, right? So Democratic Socialists of America is 30 times as large as it was five mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, campaigning for an election gives you a targeted activity uh, that, that has both a, a, a beginning and an end, right? Um, do you see this growth as uh, sort of like a point of condensation, so to speak, of all the other mobilizations that have gone on? Is it complementary, parallel, or mm. do you see these as separate, not separate struggles, but separate modes of political activity, ways of building a social movement? That's an interesting question. Um, I would say that uh, so the, the Democratic Socialists of America have um, probably been the, the central beneficiaries of uh, this radicalization, this political radicalization that is happening um, in the U.S. And it's evidenced by their um, enormous growth uh, since the election. It went from probably an organization of around uh, 2,000 people um, to almost 60,000 um, people uh, today. Um, and so I do think that um, it's a little bit different talking about uh, an organization versus a social movement, right? Um, because uh, I think that, you know, the, there's less um, pressure to deliver on a measurable outcome or measurable goal as a movement as no as a as a as an organization you know i mean you can um have several different markers of uh success so in that sense in some ways it seems more contained where uh, a social movement kind of depends on um momentum around political uh events that if there's not uh, uh, something that can be deemed a success, then the momentum is threatened and um, it's not clear, you know, you have a general sentiment that yes, police should not be killing black people, um, but I don't know if that's enough to hold together uh, an organization um, over time. So it does mean that it then matters more how you organize. Um, and I think one of the problems with um, Black Lives Matter in the United States um, was that early on um, there was not, there was a reluctance to um, create easily identifiable entry points into a general movement, meaning that there were organizations that formed, whether it was hashtag Black Lives Matter, uh, the Black Youth Project, there were other groups like that that formed that were often membership dues-based uh, organizations. So it wasn't easy. If you went to one of these big demonstrations in um, a major metropolitan area in the United States, it wasn't easy to figure out how do you plug into um, this movement. And so there was an effort in June of 2015 to have a national meeting um, of organizations and individuals who were interested in Black Lives Matter in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and that meeting very quickly um, unraveled because there was really a problem with how it had been organized in terms of uh, coming into the meeting with a very open agenda of what we should be trying to figure out. Instead, I think the organizers, um, in an effort uh, to 
you know, expedite things, came in with a kind of set um, uh, agenda. And so I think the questions about democracy, accountability, leadership, all of these came into the discussions about what is the direction um, of the movement, as well as, and as importantly, as the uh, political questions in terms of what is it that, what, what are our objectives with this? Um, mm -hmm. And, and how are we going to uh, achieve that? And I think the lack of resolution, the disconnect between thousands of people who are activated and radicalized by Black Lives Matter um, and feeling like this was a movement that wasn't in, in their control, that they had very little influence over its direction, um, helped to dissipate uh, the enormous energy that uh, it helped to gather in the first place. Yeah, let's come to the question of feminism within all this, uh, these developments. Um, you said uh, earlier in your talk, uh, you talked about interrelated wars and that, that needs interrelated analysis and criticism. Mm -hmm. And intersectionality, of course, is a, is a concept from the feminist point of view which try to bring up questions which allow to analyze things like that. Um, at the moment, the, the question of violence against women is very much on the agenda, um, especially, mm -hmm. not only, but especially also in the uh, struggles of Latin um, American women. Mm -hmm. And in, in, the, in our work, um, we have the impression that we have to learn from them to bring back questions around violence against women and gender violence against trans and uh, uh, LGBTIQ uh, people. Um, so bring the struggles back or kind, uh, kind of relate them to what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, in your book, you focus more on male, I say more because you said a lot in your talk now here, on male-to-male -male violence by the police, um, which is obviously a, a, a strong attack. How do we relate these uh, struggles? How do we um, form a really intersexual analysis um, with regard to um, public awareness, which sometimes comes back to a narrowed view, who mm -hmm. and um, yeah, who and where and when people uh, are faced with violence, and the gender aspect isn't written out of the scene sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that in the case of uh, Black Lives Matter, it was the issue of gender violence and um, policing, in particular, was written into um, the the movement in a very um, central way. Um, so I write a lot about uh, the role of uh, black queer women as um, the central organizers um, of Black Lives Matter. And, and some of that, interestingly, um, or interesting to me, has to do uh, with the ways that black men in American society have been disappeared uh, from the society. Um, Uh, as a result of premature death um, and the criminal justice system and mass incarceration. Um, and so in many of these places, uh, women um, were, you know, and this is a case in general with uh, the politics of mass incarceration in the U.S. and the ways that uh, it has uh, compounded and added uh, dramatically to the burden of black women. Um, Uh, in American society. And so, um, but as a result of that, I think that this movement, um, unlike others previous to it, uh, have focused on the ways that police abuse and violence and the criminal justice system uh, in general have a disproportionate impact um, on black women uh, as well. And so a central feature um, of, of, of this was the way that the hashtag say her name um, campaign uh, was developed specifically to call attention um, to uh, uh, the way that uh, police uh, brutality and police murder um, impacted uh, black women, the most dramatic case being that of Sandra Bland um, in Texas in the summer of, I believe it was 2015. Um, and so this, you know, I think it's important to say um, with, you know, it's a 
it's a similar point that, that black feminists have generally made, that bringing up the particular dimensions of oppression uh, of black women is not just about uh, checking a box saying, you know, please look at us and pay attention to us in particular. Um, but it's important in terms of what it tells us about um, our society, U.S. society, uh, that, you know, frames itself as this um, uh, society organized around uh, the, the structure of the family and the centrality um, of the family. And looking at the particular ways that um, black women have been abused by uh, the police and the criminal justice system um, is important in highlighting the fallacy uh, of that and, and the ways that um, that then impacts uh, uh, black life um, more generally. And so um, I think that um, Black Lives Matter, in addition to um, exposing to a great, much greater extent the systemic nature of police, um, police brutality, meaning that you know, no thinking person in the United States uh, no longer thinks that um, police brutality is just some you know, weird thing that happens with some cop having a bad day. Um, I think most people um, understand that uh, this is a, a deeply systemic problem. And I think that uh, through the work of Black Lives um, uh, Matter, we now know more about the disproportionate ways uh, that black girls are punished, um, both in schools, how they're affected, particularly um, by the school to prison uh, pipeline, the disproportionate uh, ways that they are impacted. We know more um, about the growth of, I mean, everyone in the United States is talking about decarceration and uh, the numbers of, of people who are being uh, released from jail, and most of that is driven by financial uh, uh, reasons, but the uh, uh, incarceration of black women and white women is on the rise. Um, and this is because of the proliferation of drug abuse um, and the, the, the way that um, uh, poverty uh, and what is called for white women, at least deaths by despair, um, has been uh, concentrated. The life expectancy of white women in the United States has gone into reverse, something that also never happens in the developed world um, because of what researchers define as death by despair, which is opioid addiction, uh, alcohol abuse, and suicide. Um, and so I think Black Lives Matter has brought more attention um, to these aspects of gender, in particular, um, uh, black women's experience with the criminal justice system um, than any other social movement that has been focused on uh, criminal justice uh, issues previous. Mm -hmm. Additionally, I would like to ask um, how you perceive Black Lives Matter's development with regard to the already mentioned um, uh, movements which um, went, um, yeah, which which were global ones. Me too, for example, is like on a global scale now, a discussion everywhere. Ni una menos, uh, feminicides in Latin America also. So um, when we talked last Monday, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you were saying that there's a lot of um, criticism now uh, available and um, by Black Lives Matters and other movements with regard to the US, but how do you perceive what's going on with uh, regard to feminist internationalism, to see what's going on elsewhere, to um, mm. yeah, bind together like criticism, struggle, and political aims in a more internationalist way? How can we do this? Um, well, I think, I think that um, uh, I think that in the same way that, I mean, I think that there has been a lot of um, important um, activism initiated by women um, around questions of uh, gender, social reproduction, uh, violence that um, in many ways, in terms, in many ways has, is, uh, um, leading um, uh, globally, like is at the forefront of 
uh, political movements um, on a global uh, basis. I think that Black Lives Matter um, was one aspect of that um, in the United States. And, you know, because of the focus on uh, the ways that police violence has affected um, black women, uh, may have contributed um, uh, some to a general atmosphere where uh, women are uh, organizing um, and uh, uh, taking part in important social movements. And not, you know, I think that the politics of internationalism um, are strained right now. I think that uh, there's a way that um, Black Lives Matter in the United States, for example, may have a disproportionate um, impact, not always necessarily for the best reasons, um, but because of the centrality of the United States um, and the way that uh, empire um, and its imperial dominance uh, elevates the voice of everyone who's within it. And so I had this experience and um, I traveled across Spain um, talking about my book last year and um, you know, people develop their ideas about politics and what's happening in the United States from social media, from uh, uh, Twitter, black Twitter, um, and things like that in, in ways that don't necessarily match up with uh, the reality on the ground. So many people had you know, thought of this movement as a much more cohered, cohesive um, movement than it actually is. Um, and so, nevertheless, it, it shows that there is some kind of, uh, uh, of influence, which I think is different from um, previous periods when we talk about uh, the politics of internationalism and solidarity, where uh, the perceptions are not developed through these strange modes of communication that um, uh, social media uh, can create. Um, but that there were national liberation movements that um, there was that that created a basis upon which <coughs> radicals and revolutionaries uh, from different parts of the world communicated with each other, uh, were influenced by each other, and were open to influence by each other. Um, and so, I think when it comes to the kind of different aspects of uh, feminist organizing, whether it's around uh, abortion rights, uh, whether it, they are movements against um, uh, gender violence, uh, or whether um, as an aspect of that it is the Me Too um, movement. In many ways they're happening in parallel uh, to each other and not um, necessarily in uh, direct collaboration, uh, even though I think that there is a strong sense of, um, of solidarity. I know in the United States uh, that there, and, and, and so I can speak from the perspective uh, of, of the United States that um, it can sometimes be difficult uh, to see and communicate and collaborate um, and uh, really understand the, um, the, the function of solidarity uh, with some of these other movements from uh, the, the, within the perch of uh, the U.S., even though I think everyone sees that as desirable um, and necessary. And some of that comes from a lack of understanding of the centrally oppressive role that the U.S. plays even in um, international uh, politics, the way that it constantly wields uh, its funding uh, stream to the United Nations around family planning uh, as ways to um, uh, control, you know, the reproductive freedom uh, of women outside of the country. I think that, you know, this ties into other aspects where um, there has to be a lot of uh, education and understanding within uh, the movements in the United States to understand it's the country's relationship uh, to these things that are happening outside of it. When we, were, uh, when we were preparing this event on Monday uh, and kind of explaining the format, Dr. Taylor warned us that once she starts talking, yeah. 
She doesn't usually stop. Um, I said I talk a lot. Yeah, yeah. and the answers were great, so I'm going to l- honestly leave it at that and not uh, continue our question round because we're already over time. Uh, but like we said at the beginning, there's a drink reception in the back out by the river. It's a beautiful evening out. Uh, Dr. Tay will be around for a bit. We'll be around as well. We can continue the conversation. I'd like to thank, firstly and most importantly, Dr. Taylor for coming. To the the Humboldt University American Studies Department for co-hosting with us, the Haus der Kultur in der Welt, uh, for giving us this excellent space. Uh, Please, if you haven't, don't forget to sign up uh, out back uh, on the table because we need that for our records. Uh, There might still be a couple copies of the book available, uh, in which case feel free to pick one up, and we'll hopefully see you in a few minutes at the bar. Oh, and of course the translators. The, The translators at the top, for those of you who are using them, thanks a lot.